Okay, hello everybody. It's Mitch here with another episode of the Small Town Housing Show. It is our third week in April. And for those of you who are new to the show, this version is uh, on the market update side of things right now at this point in time on the show we're sort of going with every other week as a long format interview with somebody locally here in regards to housing the housing situation uh prices the supply side uh the political side of it and on that note our guest next week is actually going to be michelle ferrari uh we're very lucky to have her on to to sit down here uh, last week and go through and do an interview in regards to the provincial view on housing right now. Uh, you know, her views as, as a member of the uh, the conservative party uh, in terms of housing and, and as an ambassador of Peterborough, um, what her take was on the housing situation and, and what our steps are going forward here. So look out for that. That's, I think we had a great chat and hit on some good points, a little bit also about the day-to-day life of, uh, that Michelle's living down in Ottawa and what it's like being, uh, you know, a member of parliament. So, um, everybody look forward to that one next week, but this week we're going to go over, uh, the market statistics that everybody loves to hear about. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief rundown about what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, before that, if, if you aren't subscribing, these videos are on YouTube weekly, uh, posted on Wednesdays. Um, guys, go ahead and subscribe. So much appreciation for the subscribes. It really helps know that people are out there watching, latching on and wanting to keep seeing this stuff every week. So if you can subscribe on YouTube and if you're on a podcast platform, we are on all the major podcast platforms. Um, if, if you don't feel like staring at me every every uh, week uh, for, for 20 minutes, then you can go ahead, jump on, on uh, any of the podcast platforms. And I, I haven't been accumulating reviews or anything there yet, but hey, any love you want to send out is much appreciated. So um Let's get on with the with the show and what you guys are are here to uh, hear. Um, diving into to start off the seven day review, I'm gonna go back with, when I shot the first video of the month. the The statistics for March, the total of the stats hadn't been uh, tabulated, so I didn't have the total breakdown of March. So I'm gonna gloss over some of that stuff. Um, we're gonna do the seven day review as we always have. What's happened in the last seven days in real estate? Um, in, in the Peterborough County and Peter, city of Peterborough area, we're going to go over, uh, the macro news hit on rate hikes, uh, the blind bidding news that's going on right now, not so much macro news, but industry, uh, news. And we're, we're going to go over a bit of the sort of buyers and sellers situations right now in terms of, you know, thinking that sort of fork in the road, what's going on with the market. Um, and, and, and that's basically it. We're going to cover real brief what's happening in Toronto and sentiment. Um, so let's get into it. Seven day review here. So we had 80 new listings. This is as of today that I pulled this off our system for Peterborough County, 80 new listings, 53 firm sales in the last seven days. How does that compare? That's 27 net new listings or the amount of listings that came on uh, that weren't be basically canceled out by by firm sales that happened in the last week. 27 in a seven day period is, is strong compared to what we've been seeing so far this year. Our inventory is still extremely low, but the trend continues to be, which is typical for seasonal, the, the seasonal activity. Uh, but, but we do feel something else has started to go on here, but nonetheless, we're seeing a ramping up most other weeks we're seeing, we're seeing in the high teens, you know, 18 low twenties of, of that, the inventory growth on a seven day period, 27 is on the higher side, had a, a had a, a week previous where we've seen higher than that, but that's on the higher side of that number continues to keep sort of moving up showing that I at least as far as I can see it in in, in the county and then it eventually will will dribble over into the city that our inventory is going to be on the rise here so um, other important notes there 18 price changes that's a huge huge statistic because in other weeks prior uh, leading up to this I mean some weeks there was almost no price changes and then we saw that number grow you know oh there's five there's seven 18 massive amount of this is obviously we're, we're having cancel relist we're having list low and holds uh people listing low 
holding off on offers, not getting adequate offers, getting no offers or not adequate offers on, on listing day, and then relisting at a higher price. We've, we've had to battle through a few of these our, ourselves. Um, and it's, it's, it's not pretty, but the market has shifted extremely quickly here in terms of what's going on out there. And a lot of these bidding wars are getting diluted down. Uh, it feels like the buyers have pulled off a little bit and the inventory is coming on fast and furious. There's competition within price category, within brackets, and it is starting to split these bidding wars apart where some are getting less offers than before, some are getting none. Um, and then, and then you have price changes happen, um, where people have to, to relist at closer to market value and not hold off on offers. So the market's becoming much more liquid that way where people are able to finally step in and get some, some, uh, you know, make purchases that aren't holding offers. Uh, we're seeing that much more common now than it was, uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, back to March's stats without going through an entire rundown, I was amazed to see that the average price actually cranked a fair amount higher in March again, um, which is surprising to me because from the March break onwards, it's felt like the buyers just stopped showing up in a lot of, at least in the high end market here in Peterborough. Um, and some of that might have to do with the fact that most people shopping in the you know seven hundred fifty thousand dollar plus close to the million dollar range they they normally are buy and sell their their move up um, clients or their move from another city clients and most of those people are sitting there going whoa you know I, I used to think that the smartest thing to do was to buy first and then list my place because I knew I could get rid of it in a week for top dollar prices were on the rise now hey if I go put a firm contract on something am I going to be able to sell my place a as fast as I thought I was and b for as much so there's a big jumble around right now um, up in that category around a million bucks in Peterborough where I think there's a bit of a, a, a shift in strategy with people and, and a lot of things on pause and it's starting to accumulate a bit of inventory, you know, over 800,000 there that I've seen in, in some specific categories and it's putting pressure on everything. Uh, price downward price pressure, that is to, to say. Um, so even though prices went up, the average per price in, in the city of Peterborough was over eight hundred thousand Peterborough, which was was a new uh, you know new heights we've reached. Um, but I just don't think that's really indicative of what's going on out there uh, to to say that March was the was the new record for price, um, because I think that it's already we're seeing it week by week right now on a comparable basis uh, that things I'm seeing a lot of things that are down five percent in a month over month or more. Um, and so to give you a couple examples, we're, you know, bringing some stuff to market this week that month and a half ago, you might've been able to get near a seven, $700,000 for it. And, and we're running comparables every day right now and looking at stuff that's going 50, $60,000 less where you're looking at mid low sixes for the exact same thing that was $700,000 a month ago. Um, likewise in the million dollar bracket, seeing things going in the low nines that were absolutely over a million a month ago, month and a half ago. Um, so, so to say that March was, was, you know, uh, record month for prices, I, I don't want to give any faulty, uh, suggestions there that we're still on the cruise and we're on the rise here. It, it seems to me with absolute certainty, boots on the ground, analyzing statistics, following what's going on in Toronto, all the news across Canada, that things are slowing down. Less buyer activity, more sellers rushing to, to, to get their, their products sold. Um, so so that's that's what I'm seeing here in, in March right now. Now, I will say one last thing is that at the end of March, the inventory is the same as it was at the end of last year, extremely low. I believe it was 0.6 months of inventory, which means uh, that if no new listings came on, uh, you know, at, at, at the end of March, but the pace of sales continued at the same speed they were in March, it would take less than half a month to burn through all the listings in the city. Um, think about this like, uh, hey, if I, in terms of the level of, of, of um, scarcity that's there and how, how worrisome it is still to be at 0.6 months of inventory. Imagine you had six months of income in your bank account as a self-employed person. Okay, I have six months of all my expenses, my household, my kids, groceries, uh, my payroll, etc. Not in a bad spot. Imagine you had nine months. Beautiful. You got so much time to operate. You, have, you could take, take a couple months off. No big deal. If you had three months of, in, of, 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 of income as a business, how would that look? 
you'd sure have to keep on on the gas and then imagine you only had half a month ahead of you of your expenses at that point for all intents and purposes you're paycheck to paycheck or worse and that is the state that our housing market is still in even though things are slowing down the the the, the things are sitting longer the buyers are pulling off the inventories on the rise at the end of march 0.6 months of inventory extremely low so we still got a long way to go um, but for anybody who watched my months of inventory video prior that i put out for people who want to do a bit more of a deep dive and post you know uh on months of inventory it seems to me that the more you dive into months of inventory and how to analyze it and that just means you know sort of the the absorption rate of our inventory how much how many homes are for sale and how many are being sold at any given point in time it's a second derivative type of thing here where uh, as the inventory goes up it's about the rate of change the quicker the months of inventory goes up seems to have more to do with how prices fluctuate in those months than the actual month of inventory um itself rather than the so you, you can point to 0.6 months of inventory extremely low high level of scarcity you can still see on a month over month basis prices go down with that because the inventory trajectory is going up and everybody knows that so uh, it, it changes the way that people behave in the marketplace. So um, moving on here to the Toronto watch, the things are, are, are definitely shaken up down there. I keep hearing stories. I had a, a phone call with, with a realtor the other day there who said he bought a place in Milton for nearly $3 million, uh, a couple months ago, close to, to peak price times. And he said, you know, when I look at similar stuff going right now, I feel like if I were to turn around and try and sell it, I'd be lucky to get high twos, you know, high mid twos. Um, so here's a guy fully admitting that he probably as a realtor probably bought and he's out, you know, a few hundred grand in, in, you know, potential equity on this thing, um, in a, in a matter of a month and a half. So the, the high end market gets hit fast. It gets hit, it gets hit hard. Um, and, and then that puts pressure on everything, you know, that the, the stuff that's worth 1.5 can only come down so much until it starts to put pressure on the stuff that was 1.1 when the month before, um, and it all starts to go. So there's a lot of, um, you know, that exact example, that agent told me, Hey, we got stuff down in Durham region here right now and closer to Toronto that used to be a sure shot at the, in these price ranges, getting 20 showings in a week. Now we're getting two, three. Um, feels like a ghost town. Um, so that that obviously can only go on so long there until it makes its way here. Because at the end of the day, the amenities, the offerings, the services of, of what is the GTA Toronto, um, it's it's still in, in, in relative value. Uh, it, it, it's still superior to Peterborough. So no matter how their product can only drop so much until it, it's going to drag all ours down. So that is coming. It's moving through the direction of Toronto. It seems still definitely to be on the, the downward stroke. Um, at least in terms of freehold detached, not talking about the condo market there because we can't go apples to apples on that. Um, sentiment right now, we've kind of already touched on it, but a lot of buyers, uh, more caution moving forward, um, than, than, than a lot of times in the last uh, year. Um, but albeit th it's been a, it's been a shaky ride up for people and it'd be a shaky ride, uh, uh, on any portion of it downwards because people have been nervous predicting, uh, you know, internalizing the, f the, the thought of a correction for, for well outside of a year now. So as much as people were nervous to buy on the way up, now we've had a really soft month. We see prices going down. People are nervous to buy now too, but also some people are, hey, I make a decision. Look, prices are already down. In some cases, 50 grand, 25 grand from what they were a month before. Do I want to bank on the fact that I think they're going to continue to go down and wait another month? Or do I jump in now instead of renting for another three, four, six months, you know, how, how you, you're in each case trying to play out this risk reward scenario on, um, theoretical equity that you would have, you bought it time X, Y, Z. And then if you had to sell in the future and in the long run, I think the one thing I would say is that for all buyers, even though it's on the, on, on, you know, it, it, we seem to be in a softening right now, if your time frame's long, it's still hard to knock the, 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 the macro the, the supply demand fundamentals in Ontario and, and, and in Peterborough specifically. Um, I still think that we, we are, are sitting in a way that there, there's going to be a bottom floor, no matter how 
fast and how much momentum we get in the downward direction here right now. Uh, because long story short, the more people that sit out, our immigration's still high and, and rents are going to start propping up. The less people that are buying, this pressure's got to go somewhere. People need shelter. We're still in a shelter crisis. I'm aware of that every day when we talk to people who are renting things out, trying to find rentals. When people go to put rentals on the market, it's nasty. And so all this buying pressure... If it's subdued, what happens to all the people that get cold feet right now and don't buy? Is the problem solved? It's not solved. These people are still there. They are either going to be waiting to buy in the future or they are going to go rent. And our rental rates are already so close, even at these higher interest rates to supporting cash flowing secondary suitable bungalows in Peterborough, that there's going to be a point where it there's an arbitrage effect where it doesn't matter. The prices can't drop anymore. The rent, the, as many buyers sit on the sidelines, rents pop up, and 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 they're gonna. Uh, arguably, I think they're gonna, you know, stop loss this thing for anybody who's who thinks in terms of the financial markets. Um, but that's a whole other topic, and I've thought a lot about that one, and I would love to do a bit more of a deep dive on that. And I think it's a bit of a um, can help relieve a lot of anxiety for people. I think we're going to have some froth cut off the top of this market here right now. Absolutely. But I think that there's a bottom floor and then the growth going forward is going to be a lot different than what we've seen the last couple of years because the cost of money is going up and it's not going to be such a free for all where there's nowhere to place capital in the entire world that makes you any money other than risk assets and, 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 and things like real estate. And now all of a sudden, you know, you can go get two and a half percent on a risk-free government bond doesn't make sense to go buy an eight unit building at a 3.5 cap that you got to put all this work into and you got the landlord tenant board crushing your your ability to operate this thing as a business so i'm just like i i, I think that the growth is the growth picture is absolutely looking different as these rates notch higher um but i still think there's a bottom floor on this thing um, so current predictions right now, guys, I'm seeing a couple months of, of how far down do we go, but I see a floor and then the, the, a more stable sideways pitcher inventory could definitely get tight in the winter. Um, but I just don't think that we're seeing the growth price growth that we have over the last two years, um, which is a very welcome thing <laughs> i think in terms of the picture of the housing continuum here and not just as individuals trying to make profits and project how to grow their wealth as a country as a province as a city we need this thing to slow down so i think that we're we're going right where we need to go you know i i think that as 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 we see a bit of the 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 steam cut off this thing and, and remember, I'm going to remind everybody again, hey, even if we go back 20% right now, including the, the what I'm deeming to already be 5% last month, if we go back another 20, you're only going back to somewhere around November of 2021. Um, you know, November, December, January, February, March. 25%. Take you back five months in time. And remember that before that, we'd gone up mid 30% the year before. And mid 20 somewhere the year before that, <laughs> you know, like that, that is just, it is not a devastating loss unless you are somebody who has bought in the last month and you have to sell again within the next six months. So I, uh, these types of numbers, the crash, the correction, there's headlines everywhere. I just, it, it, it doesn't seem to me to be, it seems natural that yes, it's going to go down a little bit. I think it's going to go more than it has right now. And then I think it's going to level out. No one knows where or when that's going to be. And then it's going to go sideways. And let's all hope that we don't have a continuing ongoing uh, market that inflates at, you know, uh, 25 to 40% a year and creates this extremely volatile financialized housing situation and environment that we live in now. Um, so anyhow i didn't touch on the seller's perspective um that that was quite a ramble there so i apologize for that uh but but that's that's really what's going on in this market right now in terms of hey what's our projections on what's gonna happen with prices these are all speculations guesses and all this is hinging on depending on of course there's still the bank of canada holds the cards do they continue to crank rates up did they do half a point again at the next meeting 
do they stop flat here for some reason? Does some other worldly news object come up where the, all of a sudden the, the, the risk is too high? Uh, now, the inflation picture absolutely seems like continued pressure on interest rates is going to be there. Um you know, with each new month that they release the inflation uh, consumer price index data and see it notching higher, it's kind of just like, hey, we already thought it was that high for a long time. How high is it really now? And with the ongoing, the, the crisis, you know, the war in Ukraine, supply chain bottlenecks, costs of all goods and services just keep going up. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's, the, the picture for interest rates is it, it does seem they're going to have to keep going up. How far do they go in the next little while? That's the thing is for me to take, make an outline and, and, and try and paint a picture right now exactly for a buyer and seller in terms of what's my best time to sell, what's my best time to buy. There's going to be volatility baked into this thing. We can guess all we want. You can take what I just gave you and if you believe every bit of it and it, and and you're in tune with that we could still all be wrong because we can't predict some of the major moving parts we're just going off the information we have right now and our best forward projections and that's all we can do so that's the still the best thing you can do as a buyer seller to to make smart moves but bearing in mind that even with the best information we've got you can get blindsided by new regulations change in interest rate policy um, any global macroeconomic headwinds, you know, if you have some more big defaults, uh, you know, the, the Chinese real estate companies, um, all this stuff, stuff, the financial markets are so globalized, so interconnected now that there, there can be a, a real check to the system at any time and no one's going to see it coming. So we're, we're talking within our predictable bounds, but all that's subject to, to, um, a lot of variability. So take it for what it is. That's all I'm saying is that we're doing our best to try and keep everybody informed and in the loop and, uh, take it with a grain of salt and make your own, uh, assessments, think your own thoughts. You know, that's very important. Make sure that you fact check this stuff for yourself and, and, and gut check it for yourself too. Where does it sit with you and your values and what, you know, how, how you learn to think about money markets, all this stuff. Um, Last thing I'm going to touch on real quick, because I'd mentioned it in the intro, is the blind bidding uh, situation. They're looking at move, removing blind bidding. Um, it sounds like they're getting a pilot thing up to get this going where they're going to have the bids uh, apparent, like in an online tracker. Um, just wanted to hit on that real quick. It's interesting. I don't know how quick they're going to be able to implement this because there's going to be a lot of information that that is housed in an offer that's going to have to be exposed on that that people are going to be able to see. You know, we're all of a sudden, hey, um, this is a live auction. All of a sudden, it's like you realize you're up against actually your cousin in this bidding war, whether you knew it or not, or your neighbor from down the street. Because I, I think that if they can't just they can't just show price. If they just show price, that that you know an offer is value. People bought, people accept an offer on value. Price is absolutely the number one variable in what, in the value equation, but also closing date. How does that align with the people's closing date? Um, conditions. Often there isn't any, but as the offers are getting less and less and less now, there, there, there sometimes is, especially on higher price properties or more unique situations where, okay, sale of buyer's property condition in there. Did you, does the person now have to disclose which property they're going to sell? And then again, you know exactly where they live, who it, all in this scenario. I don't know how they're going to deal with all the details of it. I assume they got a plan because they're moving forward with it. So it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, will this stop the price inflation? So first of all, the price inflation is already under control uh, in, 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 in the short term here. Um, so the timing is not absolutely perfect on this, uh, at least in my opinion. And I think a lot of other people's opinions Uh I think that the, that the market is softening at this time. It's not going to be as big. The battle cries over this aren't going to be as big. You, you're into situations where a lot of places aren't getting offers or you're getting two or three and, and this, you know, sort of real runaround with the offer presentation scenario is, is not the same in terms of 20 offers, you know, who's who, uh, the, the, all the, uh, all the questions that people have about this process are starting to dissolve as this really gets slower. Um, but nonetheless, my opinion is, is that yes, it may eliminate the odd scenario where uh, the buyer who wins the deal uh, was, you know, 
50% ahead of the, the person that was behind them. Um, but at the end of the day, in these situations, when these people pay these types of prices, all, all that it, sometimes what you got to realize is that the person that was in second, that was 50 grand less, they just had a more conservative disposition in terms of the way they were willing to deal with this really um, informal situation where they're spending their life's money. It doesn't mean that they were not willing to pay more money. The, the person that was 50 grand less than the top offer, they might have been willing to pay 25 grand more if they knew that there was actually another person there that was only willing to pay 23 grand more. It's not to say that that person, the second place person that was way behind this other offer, wasn't willing to put more money on the table. So what I think is that it doesn't deal with the scarcity problem. So does it does it help? It helps people trust the process and the system. Yes. Does it help resolve the price issues? No, it doesn't. Um, have you ever been to a live auction is the question I would pose to anybody. Um, I've been to a couple myself, one actually specifically for real estate uh, via an, an estate sale. Um, I, I believe it was Keith Mont, uh auction services here in town. And, uh, you know, funny firsthand story, I, I, we, we were second in place in this bid and we knew we established earlier that day what our max was, went through myself and a contractor partner. Um, we deemed this as the absolute cutoff threshold by which we can't reasonably make a, a, a solid buffer margin on this project. We're not going to take it after this. Sure enough, in the bidding war, someone else right there beside us dot that dot, dot, dot. we're going up the levels and we hit the number which was our dropout number and then we both look at each other i mean well a thousand more okay a thousand more you know when we got x amount profit price into this job uh with a little bit of risk contingency okay thousand more and then they go a thousand more a thousand more a thousand more next thing you know five thousand up and we're going okay like ah we're getting tight how about do you need this don't need it cut loose other person wins it I happened to talk to that person a matter of months later and say, how did it go? How you make it out on this thing? Could, could you flip it? And uh, the numbers didn't really work. That whole scenario, live auction, fully transparent. I'm not talking about just knowing the number the person was willing to offer. I'm talking about everybody standing on the front lawn, staring at the person who was making the offers, um, you know, holding your card in the air. Hey, I bid this, but I'm talking about that style. And still overpayments can happen because that's the nature of that situation. More people wanted that than, than, the, than, than, uh, you know, the product that was there to buy. So I'm just saying, I don't think that it really solves it. Um, adds trust. That's good. That's positive. I'm all for it. Um, don't, I don't think that anybody should have some, some real elation. You know, it shouldn't be Jubilee out there that the bidding wars are over. Prices are going to normalize. That's my stance on it. Um, the scarcity is still there. Whether you did a blind bidding war or a fully transparent bidding war on, you know, Ernest Hemingway's uh, uh, favorite pen, it doesn't matter. There's scarcity there. The bids are there. When you have, you know, you can use the desert and a water analogy. When you have all these people, thousands of them looking for, and they're scouring over, you know, 50, 60 listings in Peterborough, the scarcity is there. The mechanism of how they compete um, is, is not the root cause of the issue it's a part of the process that people don't like it they're pointing fingers at let's eliminate it perfect and then everybody's going to really see what the true issue is and it it, it lies on you know a non-elastic supply of our of our housing in in ontario so anyhow that's it for this week Everybody, look forward to the interview next week with Michelle. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Again, please like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content. Um, if you want to interact with us, you can reach out to me. I'm going to, you know, the socials would be below uh, at Mitch Cleary Real Estate on Instagram. At Mitch Cleary PTBO is the YouTube and the Twitter handle. Um, you can find us uh, at Kamar Cleary dot, at C21.ca. Um, so that's it. Uh, email, um, you'll be able to reach me through all my socials there, guys. If you want to book a consult, call myself, Tamer, Sean, um, all the gals administratively helping us on the team. We're, we're here. We're, we're doing this every week. We're helping people out all the time. Success stories every week right now on both ends of this uh, and, and fully cognizant of what's going on in the market and still having uh, success uh, within our people's goals 
in this market. So if you want to jump on a consult, you're thinking about doing anything in the next few months, half a year, and you need to start moving your big parts and pieces around to make your decisions, reach out to us. Happy to sit down, have a chat and see how we can help you steer the ship. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to talking with everybody next week and look forward to that interview with Michelle. Take care, guys.